Dr. Peter Glick is one of the world's leading scientists and communicators on global water and climate issues. He is the co-founder of the Pacific Institute and a recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship. He is also the author of the new book, The Three Ages of Water, Prehistoric Past, Imperiled Present, and Hope for the Future. Dr. Glick, welcome back to the Climate Pod. Thank you, Tony. I'm very happy to be here. Well, you've written over a dozen books on water. What made you want to write The Three Ages of Water? Oh, so that's a great question, right, to start off. Um, so many of the previous books that I've written are more technical information or background information or historical information about current events and the water crisis. Uh, for many years, uh, my colleagues and I at the Pacific Institute wrote a series called The World's Water. We did nine volumes of that every two years, sort of updating people on the status of current water issues and data and crises. But the new book, The Three Ages of Water, was, is different. It's a, a book in many ways that I've been thinking about for my entire career about water, uh, about the human history of water and the role that water has played in the development of, I mean, really from the evolution of humanity up to today's crisis, but really beyond. I wanted the last third of the book, as I'm I'm sure we'll get into, um, talks about a more positive, sustainable future and how to reach that more sustainable future. And that's a story that I don't think we hear much about the possibility that we could solve many of our water problems and move to a more sustainable, positive future. I really wanted to write that and to get it out there to a general audience. In the book, you tell the, the entire history of, of water on Earth, going all the way back to the first formation of, of hydrogen and oxygen in the universe after the Big Bang. And I, I know we're gonna we're gonna skip ahead a few billion years from, from when Earth was created to when ho Homo sapiens uh, arrived on the scene. But I, I think that's a really good place to start because I think that's really um, the, the important narrative in the book. Um, let's just let's start there. How did water influence the the evolution of early human species so this was one of the fun things actually about writing this book was I, I was able to dig into this early history of water as you as you say from the very creation of the the universe from what we know the formation of hydrogen the formation of oxygen the, the molecules that make up water uh through to the formation of our own solar system and how how is it that earth ended up with its water and the the, our current understanding of the origins of water on the planet, uh, up until, and this was really interesting to me, the very evolution of Homo sapiens, which of course in a blink of an eye has just been very recent in the billions of years history of the earth. It's just the last few hundred thousand years. Uh, and the role that water played, not just in the evolution of Homo sapiens and the success of Homo sapiens and the the, uh, of all of the species of early hominins uh, that, that ultimately led to us, but also the role that water played in helping Homo sapiens survive and migrate out of Africa, our, our ancestral home, and the importance of water in that, in that dynamic, the, the changes in climate, the changes in water availability, the changes in, in the landscape that permitted Homo sapiens not just to thrive, but then ultimately to spread over the entire planet. It was fascinating to read uh, and to help me understand, you know, I've thought about water for a long time and the importance of water today, but the importance of water in these early days was new to me. And, and it was a, a, a fun piece to, to add to the book. Yeah, we know that early societies were developed around reliable water sources, but we also know that there are natural changes to the climate that can impact the hydrologic conditions for any given place over a long enough period of time. What are those naturally occurring climate changes and, and how did those changes impact early humans? Yes, yeah, so it turns out it wasn't just good water conditions that helped Homo sapiens survive, but it was the variability of the climate that Homo sapiens learned to adapt to, to the extreme events. And the fact that Homo sapiens ultimately were able to live successfully in dry conditions and wet conditions was a really important factor in their ability to outcompete other species. Uh, the climate has always changed naturally. This is something that, that climate scientists have understood for a long time. 
the Earth has gone through ice ages and what we call interglacial periods when it was warmer. Uh, those periods of climatic variability are natural. They're the result of the dynamics of changes in the Earth's orbit over literally hundreds of thousands of years and changes in the Earth's tilt over tens of thousands of years and changes in the Earth's rotation over tens of thousands of years. And those cycles, they're called Milankovitch cycles, named after a, a very famous European climate scientist many, many years ago who figured this out. Uh, those cycles have led to the fluctuations, the ice ages, and then the warm periods, and then again, ice ages over millions of years. And those natural changes in climate, uh, now very well understood, helped contribute to the evolution of Homo sapiens and the situation we're in today. And, and how did human life change, early human life change, once those Homo sapiens were able to first kind of understand and then manipulate water for their needs? Well, in the first case, in the second case for manipulation, the ability of early humans to manipulate their environment was, was critical to our success. Uh, we learned uh, to, and, and this is described in the first, the, the, the three ages of water is about these three ages. And the first age is really this early period of time up until uh, about a thousand years ago when the second age, which we can talk about began. But this in this first age, Homo sapiens learned how to manipulate water, to control floods and droughts, to invent the first agriculture that permitted very small hunter-gatherer communities to grow and become agricultural communities and support bigger and bigger populations. Uh, the very first aqueducts were built to move water from one place to another uh, or dams to store water in wet periods so we could use it during dry periods. This first age of water really was the first manipulation of the hydrologic cycle when we learned to control our environment rather than just suffer from the vagaries of our environment. And that manipulation really defines us in many ways. And that manipulation evolved and improved over uh, over you know generations and generations of humans um, still kind of staying in that early ancient civilization time. How did ancient rulers during those you know of the civil of the great early civilizations that um, that we all can think of? How did those rulers use water? to further their political and economic influence. Yeah, so, so as archeologists have uncovered more and more information and understanding about these early civilizations and ultimately these early empires, we've learned that especially in ancient Mesopotamia, the Sumerians, the uh, Akkadians, the Babylonians, they built their empires alongside the major rivers of the Middle East, the Tigris and the Euphrates River. Uh, the great Indus empires in, in Southern Asia built their empires along the Indus River. Uh, the great empires, the early empires in China built their empires along the major rivers, the Yangtze River, the Yellow River, the, the Huangho River, all, all of the, the big reliable sources of water. And they used that water in a number of different ways. They used it, of course, to grow, grow food for their burgeoning empires. Uh, the ability to grow food, this early agriculture, let them expand their cities and expand their empires and build their power. But they also learned to move water from one place to another. They learned to control floods. Uh, they learned to use water as a weapon. Uh, and there are a number of examples in the book where we, we see the first water wars in the ancient Middle East, 2400 BC, and, and around uh, the city city-states of Uma and Lagash from ancient Mesopotamia. Um, the first water laws were created by these early empires to help control and manage the water systems that, that they built. Uh, all of this information comes from the early archeologists, the archeologists, uh, the evidence from, from ancient writings, uh, and it helps inform what we know now about the transformation of humanity. 
You do such a great job in the book of, of showing water's influence really on every aspect of human life. One area that people might not think about is its impact on religion and the mythologies of different peoples. You're talking about, you know, the um, the empires that were, that, that kind of came up um, alongside rivers like the Tigris and the Euphrates. What was Rot Water's role in kind of the earliest human stories that were that were passed down over generations? So every early culture has what we call origin stories, uh, stories that they developed to help them understand or to explain their existence, the creation of humanity. How, how did that come about? You know, modern science has information about that, but these early cultures all developed stories, creation stories, creation myths about the gods and the role that water played, you know, from the early Christian and Muslim and Jewish traditions, the Hindu traditions, the, the early Buddhist traditions, they all describe the role of water, uh, the role that early gods played in creating water or manipulating water. Uh, the story of Noah and earlier stories about the floods uh, from ancient Sumeria that describe how the gods got angry at humanities and wiped out humanity and one one human or one human family survived to repopulate uh, the earth. All of those have common elements in them, and they all have a role, have, have ties back to our early understanding of the roles of water. I know there isn't a single event, but what period of time would you kind of count as the transition between the first age of water as you define it and the second age of water? I think of the second age of water, which is our age, as the age of science and technology and cultural and artistic revolutions. In part, it's the early revolutions in, in the Renaissance. Uh, earlier, some of the, the brilliant work of ancient, of early uh, Muslim scholars, in the golden age of, of Islam around 900, was a period of time basically when we started to apply and improve our understanding of science and technology and culture to water. We learned what hydrogen was, we learned what oxygen was, we learned about the elements, we learned that water was a molecule composed of hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, we learned uh, about the role of water and water-related diseases. You know, in the first age of water, water-related diseases were rampant, uh, as unfortunately they, they still are today in some places. But, but at the time, we had no understanding of what they were. And the second age of water brought to bear uh, science and medicine to try and understand and to explain the role that water played in uh, diseases like cholera and dysentery and guinea worm and so on. Uh, they were period, the second age was a period of time when we applied technology so that we could build aqueducts not, you know, a few kilometers or tens of kilometers long dug out of dirt, but hundreds or thousands of kilometers long. We could build dams not just to store a little bit of water and try and protect against floods, but to, to produce hydroelectricity and to really uh, build uh, resilience against floods and droughts. And so modern technology has played an important role in the second age of water. Um, and it was a period of time when human populations and economies were growing massively. Uh, the population grew from, you know, a few tens of millions to hundreds of millions and then billions of people and our economies grew equally. And we had to develop systems to get the water that those growing human populations and economies needed. And so it was a period of time when we started really taking massive amounts of water out of ecosystems. Uh, and all of those factors led to, I would argue, both great improvements in human health and, and well being and economies, but also uh, some unintended consequences as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, speaking of, of the improvements in human health, um, those first water treatment facilities, when were they put in place? Yeah, so one of the fun stories in, in uh, a couple of the fun stories in the second age of water that I write about are first, the discovery by a, a, a doctor in England named John Snow, who in the middle of the 1850s, really in the middle of the 1800s, when cholera was sweeping across the globe, through Europe, through Russia, through Asia, across the Atlantic to America and killing 
hundreds of thousands of people, Dr. John Snow in London really was the first to figure out and prove that cholera was a water-related disease, that it was transmitted by bad contaminated water, not through the air, not by person-to-person -person contact, by, but by contaminated water. And that discovery then led to a whole series of, uh, of improvements in technology to try for the first time to deal with contaminated water. And the second story is the story about a, a really a water manager, a, a, a sort of a health expert, but also an engineer named John Leal uh, in Jersey City, New Jersey, who was forced with, uh, forced to deal with increasing water related diseases in New Jersey at the time, in particular typhoid, that he believed was caused by contaminated water. And he was ordered by the courts to clean up the water system in Jersey City. And he took the bold step of proposing a new water treatment system using chlorine to kill bacteria in contaminated water. Never been used before for a large city, had never been used before for a major water treatment plant. But he, he built in a very short period of time the first what we would consider modern water system to treat contaminated water with chlorine and proved that he could purify the water for a big city with proper chemical treatment and proper what we would consider today modern water treatment. And within a, this was in 1909. And within a very few years, every major water system in the United States was moving toward what we would now consider modern water treatment. And the incidences of cholera and dysentery and typhoid plummeted, human health and life expectancy expanded rapidly in the United States. And these modern water systems have now been replicated in many other parts of the world. I think that's it's that's a, such an incredible part of the story about how quickly that those technologies not only were proven to work, but also how quickly they spread um, throughout the world. But at the same time, you know, fast forward 115 years or so uh, to today, and there's still a ton of people, like you said, that do not have access to clean drinking water. This is not a technical problem. This is a problem that was solved over a hundred years ago. So, so what's keeping so many people today from getting access to clean drinking water? Well, that's right. As, as I said earlier, the second age of water in my, uh, in my mind is our age of water. It's this period of time that many of us have lived through where we have applied science and technology and art and culture to improve our water situation. But it's also been a period of time of unintended consequences and failures. Uh, and one of those failures, in, in my mind, arguably the most severe failure in the water world is the failure to provide safe water and sanitation to everyone on the planet. We have the technology, we know how to do that. We've done it in developed world, uh, in the developed world, um, mostly, not entirely, I would note. Uh, but it's not a problem of lack of technology. It's not a problem of lack of money. The amount of money required to provide safe water and sanitation for everyone on the planet is far outweighed by the cost of failing to do so. The, the economic and health costs and, and impacts on women and girls in particular who have to carry water from contaminated water sources in many developing countries for hours rather than going to school and contributing to the economy. Those are massive costs that far exceed the cost of providing safe water and sanitation. But we have failed to do so. You know, governments have a lot of things on their plate. They have to deal with education and communications and all sorts of aspects of, of development that, that challenge them. A lot of them are corrupt or are mismanaged. Um, uh, and so that, that, in my opinion, is the greatest failure, water failure, of the second age of water. How did humans' view of water change over this period of time, this, the second age of water? Well, in part, uh, in the first age of water, it was just a resource. It was, it was just there, and we used it when we could, and we dumped our wastes in it, uh, because that's what we knew how to do. And it, when populations were small and life was kind of short and brutish anyway, 
uh, we didn't understand or we didn't know what we were doing. And in the second age of water, we've learned more about water and the importance of water for our civilization and our society and our industry and ecosystems. Um, and I would argue that now people not just understand more about water, but care about water. You know, if you look at public opinion polls about the environment, first of all, the public opinion polls about the environment show people care about the environment in general. And that's always been true, but always at the top of the list is care about water quality and water availability. And that's been pretty constant for over surveys over the last century, really. Uh, water is very important to people. It's the resource that that people understand is critical for us and care about a lot. You've already mentioned a few times uh, the the term water crisis, right? And you also talk about in the book the fact that um, we're not going to run out of fresh water anytime soon as a whole, right? The earth as a whole, we're not even close to tapping into all of the fresh water that's available. How, how do those two things square? Well, so in, in part, the earth has as much water on it today as it had 4 billion years ago at the start when we first got our water. Um, water is conserved worldwide. It's a, it's a naturally renewable resource. The hydrologic cycle that we all learn about, of course, in second grade that we remember, I'm sure you remember, Ty, is evaporation and the formation of clouds and condensation, precipitation back down to earth, runoff back to the oceans and then evaporation. That's the hydrologic cycle, and it's a renewable cycle. Um, but there is a water crisis, and that, it takes many forms. Part of it is this failure to meet basic human needs for water and sanitation for everyone. Part of, is it, part of it is the ecological consequences of taking water out of the environment and out of ecosystems for our own use, and either putting it back contaminated or putting it back somewhere else. And that hurts the ecosystems and ecosystem health described extensively in the book as a serious part of the world's water crisis. Uh, we have conflicts, growing violent conflicts over water resources, uh, over access to water and control of water or use of water as a tool or a weapon or a casualty of conflicts. That's another part of the world's water crisis. Um, and of course, global climate change now is, is increasingly a critical piece of the issue. Um, you know, as you know, Climate change is real, as you know, it's human cause that that's indisputable. Not that it's not disputed, but it's not it's indisputable. It's a fact. Um, and some of the worst impacts of climate change will be on water resources. It affects the hydrologic cycle, higher temperatures, changes of evaporation rates, uh, and increases the demand for water. Uh, more water in the atmosphere means more intense storms, and more energy in the atmosphere means more intense storms. And we're already seeing more droughts and floods. There are a whole series of water-related consequences to climate change, and that's part of the water crisis as well. There, there's a saying, if climate change is uh, a shark, water resources are the teeth, because that's what's going to bite us. That's what's going to hurt us the most. Well, we've heard the term peak oil tossed around a lot by the oil industry over the decades. Is there such thing as peak water? Well, yes, I wrote a I wrote an article, a, a peer-reviewed science article about peak water that came out a number of years ago that described uh, this issue in the context and in comparison to the discussion we've had for many years about peak energy and peak, peak oil. Um, as I said a moment ago, water is a renewable resource. You take water out of a river, that doesn't have any effect on how much water we get next year because the hydrologic cycle renews that water with rainfall and snow and snow melt. Um, but so water in a river is a renewable resource. But when you take all of the water out of a river, you can't have any more, as we do with the Colorado River. Colorado River doesn't reach its mouth anymore. The, the Yellow River in China no longer reaches its mouth most many for much of the year and most years. Uh, that's a peak renewable constraint. We might want more water out of the Colorado, but once you're taking all of the average flow, you can't have any more. You know, you get more next year, but but you can't forever increase what your withdrawal is. That's a peak renewable water crisis. But it turns out that some water resources are not renewable resources. They're like oil, like groundwater resources. If you have a water resource that is recharged very slowly, like a groundwater aquifer, 
more slowly than we withdraw water out of it. And when, when, if withdrawal rates are faster than recharge rates, water levels go down just like oil. And so there are peak non-renewable challenges as well. We're overdrafting groundwater worldwide, in the Central Valley and the Great Plains of the US, in China, in India, uh, meaning we're taking water out faster than nature recharges it and water levels are dropping. A very significant amount of food production today worldwide comes from non-renewable groundwater. And that's a peak non-renewable water crisis. We write in the book that society must transition away from the hard path and toward the soft path of water. What is the soft path of water? Well, let me start with the hard path. The, the hard path is what I describe as basically what we've been doing in the second age of water. That is the idea that uh, demand for water would increase. And so we just forever had to find new supply to meet that growing demand. And the assumption that demand would forever increase meant in the hard path, an assumption that we would always have to find more supply, build more dams, build more aqueducts, take more groundwater. That was a hard path solution. Uh, the hard path also said, uh, we don't care about what happens to ecosystems. We'll take water out and ecosystems are a separate problem, or we didn't understand what we were doing to ecosystems. And so the hard path sort of ignored ecological factors. The hard path says water is an economic good and taking water out for human use improves our economics. You, you take water out and you grow food with it, you build semiconductors or other goods and services and that produces benefits for the economy. Um, it gave no value in the hard path to ecological costs, uh, to the failure to provide safe water for humans. Uh, it ignored the human cost of water related diseases. It, only looked at water as an economic good, as a resource to be consumed. And finally, the hard path really was sort of centralized institutions, uh, you know, water utilities that would manage water in a, in a silo, um, big companies that would use water for economic benefit without paying any of the costs of taking water out of systems. So it was sort of an institutional centralization of water as well. And the soft path that I've defined which I've defined in part because I think it's a path toward a more sustainable future is in many ways the antithesis of the hard path. It says water demand doesn't have to grow forever. It says water use efficiency and conservation can let us do much more with the water we're already taking and grow our economies and grow our population without growing our demand for water. And in fact, I would argue that's already happening in the United States, for example, and I can come back to that. But the soft path also says there are new supply ideas that don't require damaging ecosystems. Uh, water reuse, you know, we collect a lot of wastewater, we treat it to a pretty good standard, often to a very good standard, and then we throw it away. But that's a new source of water and more and more regions around the world are looking at treated wastewater as a source of supply or desalination as a potential source of supply. It's expensive. It's ecologically challenging to do it right, um, but it's a source of supply that doesn't require draining rivers and aquifers. Uh, the soft path also says you have to protect ecosystems. Ecosystems can can uh, ecosystems provide enormous benefits to us, and in the soft path, we have to protect them as well. The soft path also says water is an economic good. Yeah, but it's also a human right. The UN declared a human right to water in 2010. Let's balance the human right to water and the economic benefits of water. And if you do that, then there are different kinds of water policies that we can put in place as well. And the soft path says we need smarter institutions that water manage, that manage water not just as a water resource, but manage water and energy together, or water, energy, and food together, or ideally water, energy, food, and climate together. And these new ways of thinking altogether are what I call the soft path for water. I'm so glad you talked about the water efficiency improvements that we're already seeing here in the United States and, and elsewhere. There is a graph in the book that I think is probably one of the most powerful um, images I've ever seen uh, that would lead you to believe, hey, we can probably solve this thing. 
there's the graph shows um GDP and population growth over time, it's nonlinear growth over time, um, as well as water uh, consumption, water, I believe it's a water extraction over time. And they, they they parallel each other, as you would expect over time, both nonlinear growth um, over time until about 1970. That's when uh, here in the United States, uh, GDP and population continued to grow nonlinearly, but water consumption or extraction started to level off and even get to the point where it started to decline. Um, all of that was a result of regulations. How important are regulations uh, to improving water efficiency and, and hitting some of the goals uh, that you described and, and the, the soft path of water? Yeah, so for those people watching the video, I don't know if you can see this, but this is the graph. And as Ty mentioned, it's from 1900 up until about the present. And it shows two things. It shows the gross national product, the economy of the U.S., and total water withdrawals, water use for everything. And it shows GDP going up and up and up. That economists love to see that growth in our economy. Um, and yet water use went up in lockstep for a long time, as Ty said, up until about the mid-1970s. And then it turned around, those two graphs split apart. And today, water use in the United States is less than it was in the 1970s. And it's actually a result of a couple of things. One is a great improvement in water use efficiency. We're doing more with the water we're already taking out of the system. Uh, we're growing more food with better irrigation systems. We're washing our clothes and dishes and flushing our toilets with better technology in our homes that let us do what we want with less water. There have also been some fundamental changes in our economy. We're using uh, less water intensive industry and the industries that we have have become more efficient. We make steel with a lot less water today than we did 50 years ago. Uh, the amount of water required to make a semiconductor today is much less than it was at the beginning of the computer revolution. Um, this is an example that we don't have to extract more and more water from our systems to meet the demands of our population and our economy. And this is not well understood by the public or frankly, many of my colleagues in the water world that still tend to think, okay, we always have to find more and more water and take it out of the system. But it's also proof in my mind that the soft path for water is a possibility, that we're already on that path and that really what we need to do is more of the smart things, fewer of the dumb things, uh, and expand to scale the success stories that we see all around us. Yeah, we often talk about this on the Climate Pod that so many of these problems that we face today, um, they're the solutions are are here. These these are no longer you know problems of lack of technology, but really problems of lack of political will. And as you know, as we talked about in the 1970s, I mean, 1970s were critical for all kinds of new, you know, water regulations. We talked about the efficiency of water, the you know, the efficiency efficiency standards that were put in place and continued to improve upon over time um, under you know Democratic and Republican administrations. Of course, the Clean Water Act was critically important um, to you know the the country really protecting and preserving water here in the United States. Um, but just two weeks ago, the Supreme Court ruled against the EPA's ability to protect wetlands from pollution under that Clean Water Act that, is, that has been in place for um, almost 50 years, or well over 50 years now. How detrimental do you think is this ruling? Terribly de detrimental. That ruling was a travesty. It was a travesty of science. It was a travesty of law. It was a travesty of ecological, the concept of ecological protection. Um, uh, I'm an optimist in general. I believe in the long arc of history, uh, moving in the right direction. Uh, this was a terrible step backward. I do believe that in the long run, it'll be overturned and, or, or new legislation will be passed that ultimately will expand protection of some of these incredibly vulnerable wetlands that we're losing. Uh, absolutely, it was a step backward. And it, you know it's always sad to see a step backward. But the fact that 
smart regulations have been proven to work in the efficiency standards in the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, that have helped us restore the health of rivers, that have helped us restore air quality around the world, that have helped protect drinking water, uh, that have helped improve the efficiency of appliances and the improvements in efficiency in industries around the country and frankly, in other parts of the world as well. Those are steps in the right direction. And I can't help but hope and believe that in the long run, we'll continue to move in that direction. Well, the Western United States, um, where you are, where the Pacific Institute is located, obviously, and and uh, that's where the f focus of your research is. The Western United States, as you write in the book, is a perfect example where water was simultaneously viewed as vital for economic development, but also a dangerous and unreliable resource. How has the West's relationship with water changed, and, and what are California and, and other drought flood prone states doing to more sustainably utilize water? Well, of course, the Western US has always had a incredibly complex history around water. Uh, it's, it's much more arid, much more dry than the Eastern United States. Um, the agriculture that has developed out here is different than the agriculture that can rely reasonably well on rainfall because we don't have reasonably reliable rainfall. And that led to the irrigation systems that we built, uh, the massive dam construction projects that helped both irrigate the West and produce hydropower uh, have been incredibly beneficial. But it's also a region where we've learned about our vulnerability to water, uh, the extent to which climatic factors and the extreme events that the West is subject to and now increasingly subject to because of climate change, um, have helped define water laws. They've helped define the way we've built our systems. Um, uh, and it's a constantly evolving problem and process. You know, the, the changes in climate in the last couple of decades have led to a growing awareness of the threat of climate change and a growing effort to try and address, at least partially, slowly, incrementally, some of the water-related challenges we have with overdraft of groundwater, uh, with more persistent droughts, with more persistent extreme events, with changes in the timing of snowpack from the mountains. All of those are new factors that water managers and institutions and experts are having to try and deal with. You know, I was reading the book. Um, there's a there's an entire section, um, maybe even a chapter, on Tulare Lake in California. And, and to be honest with you, before this year, I don't think I've ever heard of Tulare Lake, but it has been in the news quite a bit this year. Um, after you wrote the book and, and probably sent it to the publisher, uh, it is in the news. Uh, it's been in the news quite a bit over the last few months. Do you mind just kind of telling a little bit about the history of Tulare Lake um, up until you finished the book, but also what's happened this year? Yeah, it's a great story. Um, so before white settlers came and Western settlers came to California uh, and started to intensively modify our landscape here, Tulare Lake was a huge lake. That I think this may have been the second largest lake in the Western United States in, in area, fairly shallow, not, not very deep, but, but a huge lake at the southern part of the San Joaquin Valley. Um, fed by the Kings River, the Kern River, a number of rivers in the southern part of the, from the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Uh, enormous lake. And then as we settled California and as we started to divert the rivers for agriculture and for the growing cities, Tulare Lake started to dry up as we took all the water. And it ultimately did dry up completely. And it became part of the agricultural system. It, farmers came and planted, you know, planted crops in, in the lake beds, very good soils. Um, uh, but in the last 12 months, really, first of all, we've had an incredibly wet year this year, a huge snowpack, two, more than 200% above normal, especially in the southern part of the mountains in the Sierra Nevada. Uh, and that snowpack has melted and it's starting to run off. And the Kings River and the Kern River and all the rivers in the southern part of the mountain range are flooding. And there's nowhere for that water to go except back into the old Tulare Lake bed. And so Tulare Lake has reappeared 
and it's flooded massive amounts of farmland. There are a few towns that have flooded in the southern part of the of the region as well. Um, you know, I suspect it'll be ephemeral. I don't know how long it'll last. It depends on if the next few years are wet or dry. But it's an indication of both the ability of humans to affect the natural system and to dry up something like Tulare Lake, but then to be vulnerable ultimately to the vagaries of an extreme climate and the realization that we're still vulnerable to these extreme, extreme events. We should not assume that floods have disappeared in California and we should not be building in floodplains. Maybe that's a lesson, not just for California, but for people around the world. Yeah, I mean, if, if you could kind of tell humans to change one way that they think uh, they think about water, um, or maybe we, we think about it now here in the second age of water, in order to ensure a more successful third age of water, what would that be? Probably the most important thing is to understand that we're not separate from the hydrologic cycle. We're not separate from water resources. We are part and parcel, not just in our origins, but in our very survival uh, to uh, the water system. And that if we learn about our role, good and bad, uh, and if we learn how to manage our water system in a more sustainable fashion, then a better future is possible. You conclude the book by saying, I believe that a positive future in the third age of water is not only possible, but inevitable. What gives you that certainty that humans will transition away from the old way of thinking and, and start thinking about water in, in a more holistic manner, like, like you said? Well, maybe I'm a blind optimist and I'm wrong. And in fact, our, our future will be this dystopian future that you see in the movies and science fiction stories and, and we hear in the press. That would be a shame. Um, but the reason I believe that a sustainable future is possible is that I see all around us the successful efforts of communities and people and governments and companies and individuals to move in the right direction. Um, I see better integration and understanding of the role of the environment. I see more efficient water use and the ability to grow of, by farmers to grow more food with less water. I see industries beginning to understand the role that they play in water extraction and water pollution and move toward more corporate stewardship around water. So I see the success stories out there. I know that if we're, if we're smart, we can move to a sustainable future. I don't, I'm not blind to the fact that there'll be a lot of pain and there already is a lot of pain today about unsustainable water practices and unsustainable environmental practices as a whole. There's already too much water-related disease. There are too many children that die from totally preventable water, you know, cholera and dysentery and typhoid because we haven't provided them with safe water and sanitation. I know that there's going to be inevitable climate disruption, but in the long run, we're, we have the ability to get those things under control. And if we can do the smart things faster, the pain will be less, the damages will be less, the bad things will be less, and that sustainable future will come earlier. Um, again, I think it's inevitable. I, I know that there will be pain along the way, but the path is increasingly apparent and increasingly possible. Well, Dr. Golick, thank you so much for speaking with me today. And and also, thank you for being gracious enough with your time four years ago to come on just our ninth episode ever. Here we are, 232 episodes later, and I cannot tell you what an honor it is again to be able to speak with you and to learn from you. There is so much in this book that we did not cover. So I highly recommend anyone listening to go check out The Three Ages of Water. We'll put a link to the book in the show notes. So please go buy it. Dr. Glick, thank you again for joining me today on the Climate Pod. Hi, thanks for having me on. Um, the book was fun to write. There are a lot of great stories in there, and there is a positive hope for the future. Uh, and congratulations on the long-term success of, of the Climate Pod. So thanks for having me.